بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. As always, we begin with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa taala and by sending peace and blessings upon the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and upon his family and his companions. This is perhaps one of the most exciting talks that I have been asked to prepare in terms of my personal interest and in terms of all of the information that I want to convey to you. And if anything, perhaps the problem is that there is a bit too much information to convey six and a half years worth, and indeed probably more than that if we talk about before and after, to convey seven or eight years worth of, of history and of benefit and information and experience into 45 minutes is a difficult thing to do. However, I will seek the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in doing so. And uh, I have sort of, I mean, from what I have heard of the previous uh, lectures from the brothers who came before me, I've thoroughly enjoyed them. So I hope that inshallah ta'ala today will also be enjoyable and will be of benefit. Because I think all of us, when we started this program or this series of talks with the intention of telling you of our experiences in Medina and our memories of studying in Medina, I think that every single person who has spoke has intended a benefit greater than simply telling you a story. A benefit in some of the, the lessons of seeking knowledge and indeed for me, it is about being able to, if you like, support a generation of students who will come after me and will come after the brothers who are speaking and who have spoken over the last couple of weeks and for those people to be better than we were and to achieve something better than we achieved. And I think that if this lecture goes some way towards inspiring somebody to do that or supporting somebody in doing that, then this will be a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'd like to begin my memories of Medina with a little bit of background about myself, as the brother said, I became Muslim at the age of 14. I went through a couple of years of struggling to practice. And I think I was probably somewhere between 17 and 18 years old when I really decided to commit myself to practicing Islam as best I could. And it was at that time that somebody told me about the Islamic University of Medina. And I vaguely remember the brother telling me, uh, in, in a sense of him saying to me, you know, there's this place you can go, you can study, it's set up for people who are reverts like yourself, they teach you Arabic, and you can come back and work in Dawah. That's pretty much how he explained it to me. He said, you can come back and work in Dawah. And I thought, this is something amazing. And since I heard about it, I had something in my heart that this is something that I want to do. I did relatively well at school in terms of my grades and so on and so forth. I had all of the conditions that I needed in order to apply. And so I had in my mind that this is something I really, really want to do. Now, at this point, I want to introduce or to, or to, to mention the first benefit or my first piece of advice, which is that many, many people get to this stage that I'm telling you about now. They've heard about Medina, and Medina is something really interesting and something really amazing, and you know, they have this idea that you can come back and you can work in the field of da'wah, whether it be uh, towards Muslims, or whether it be in a masjid, or whether it be in an Islamic organization, or whether it be towards the non-Muslims, but you have an idea that you can make a, a career or a living out of it. A lot of people get to that stage. But I want you really to, to pay attention and to reflect upon how you get from that stage to actually committing yourself to studying and to learning Islam and actually being willing to make the sacrifices. For me, I looked at the conditions that were required. As always, we, you know, I looked on the internet and you, know, you get a varied sort of mix of what people tell you you need, but you come up with an idea of something that you need 
uh, and I settled on the problem being the tezkiah, that I needed to get a reference. And it so happened that in Newcastle, the main masjid that we have uh, in Newcastle, uh, Masjid Tawheed, Newcastle Central Mosque, there is a Saudi sheikh who visits every single year and he visited and helped to build the masjid. So naturally, he was the first person that I went to. And I remember going to him and I was a little bit nervous. Uh, and I think it was at the time that Sheikh Sudais came to Newcastle. And of course, I asked uh, Sheikh Sudais, as is the norm and in Newcastle, it's probably a little bit easier to ask someone like him than it is here where you have stewards and you have everything sealed off. In Newcastle, we went and we asked him. And Sheikh Sudais, uh, as is his nature, he's very welcoming and he was very much like, yes, I'll help you, I'll do what you need. But he's also very busy. And he soon forgot about what I asked him to do and probably was asked by another 50 or 100 people on the same trip and he forgot. So I got the impression that this uh, promise of his was something that he made with good intentions, but it wasn't something that really was ever going to result in me getting accepted into the university. So then it came to this Sheikh Muhammad Saleh who comes every year to Newcastle. And I sat with him with the translator and I explained to him that we'd asked Sheikh Sudais but that the Sheikh had not gotten back to me and perhaps he'd forgotten. And would he give me a tezkiah? And I remember, and I'm going to give you by meaning because I can't remember the exact words, but he said to me something like this. He said to me, do you know any Arabic? And I said, the translator, translated. I said, no, I don't know any Arabic. He said, uh, do you, you know, attend any lessons? Do you travel to learn? Do you go to the other cities? I said, no. He said to me, you want to travel thousands of miles away from your family, away from your friends, to a country with a completely different climate that you're not used to, it's very hot, and you want to, or you have an idea that you're going to go there and study when you can't make the effort to study here in your own country. When the opportunities are all around you and it just requires a little bit of effort. And he said, I'm not going to give you a tezkiah. And I was very angry with him at the time. I said, why is he being like this, you know? And I told him that Sheikh Sudais forgot about my request. And, and now what do I do? And he's, not, he's refusing to give it. And I don't understand. Wallahi, if you take nothing away from this talk today except that advice, it would be worth you coming. Because when I went to Medina, I realized the value of the advice that he gave me. When you go to Medina, you are the same person. If you are lazy in the UK, you will be lazy in Medina. Except those who Allah has mercy upon. If you're not making an effort to travel five miles in the UK, you won't make an effort when you travel how many thousand miles to Medina. This is the reality of study. How many of the brothers, the shaitan, and this is from Talbis Iblis, from the tricks of the shaitan upon them, that the shaitan comes to them and tells them, if you go to Medina, you're going to be a good person. If you go to Medina, you're going to have istiqama. If you go to Medina, you're going to be able to study. If you go to Medina, you'll learn Arabic. Ya Ikhwan, in reality, if I'm talking about Birmingham, I see that the brothers from Birmingham are not willing to travel to Dudley for the beneficial knowledge. Is this true or not? You're not willing to travel to Dudley. Rather, some of you are not willing to travel to the other side of Birmingham for beneficial knowledge. Wallah, this person will never be successful in Medina. Except who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy upon. You make the effort now and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the ability to make the effort there. And I didn't realize the value of this. I was very angry with the sheikh. Because he didn't give me the tezkiah and he was, wasn't very nice to me about it. And he told me the painful, bitter truth. But it was the truth. That if I wasn't willing to make that effort here, then in reality, not a lot is going to change over there. And all of the students I met in Medina, I didn't meet a student except this applies to them. 
that if they worked hard and they strived hard in the UK, you saw them working hard and striving hard in Medina. And the vast majority of them who came lazy went home lazy. And so this is something that I want to emphasize to people, that you do not need to wait for Medina to come or for another university to come for you to learn your deen. You can start learning and striving and struggling now and then when the opportunity comes and if the opportunity comes for those people that it comes for, alhamdulillah. And if it doesn't, it shouldn't get in the way of you learning your deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not limited learning your religion to one city in the world or two cities in the world or three. Every single person has the ability, but you know what it is, it's hard. You have to get up at times you don't want to get up and you have to go places you don't want to go and you have to suffer and you have to you know, have a bit of blood, sweat and tears. And this has to happen now for those people who want to study. So I kind of gave up on the Tezkiah idea and I kind of put Medina on the back burner. And I remember I was teaching in the masjid. Uh, I think we were, was teaching Quran to the children in the masjid. And I got a phone call from Sheikh uh, Shu'aib Mirpuri, who was the general secretary of uh, the Markaz Jamiat Ahl Hadith at the time. And he said to me, Brother Muhammad, would you like to go to Hajj? I said to him, Sheikh, I'd love to go to Hajj, but uh, I can't afford it. He said, no, you can go to Hajj for free. And I think this is probably the first experience I had of the Saudi system, except you have to get your passport to me tomorrow with the photocopies and with the medical certificate and everything has to be done like yesterday. So quickly, quickly it was all put through and uh, we ended up, it was so late and so last minute that they actually sent the visas to the airport when we were getting on the plane. They sent the passports with the visas in to the airport when we were getting on the plane. And uh, at this time, uh, just before that trip, uh, I think I had uh, first of all been for my khitbah to uh, uh, ask for my uh, wife's uh, hand in marriage. And I'd agreed that we, I was going to get married after the Hajj. And this is because Medina really wasn't in my mind. Um, and I didn't really have a great deal of knowledge about what it was going to be like as a married student. So I went ahead and kind of put Medina on the back burner and decided to get married. And at this point, I had decided uh, to get married and I went on this uh, Hajj trip. And of course, when I went on Hajj, I saw in the itinerary that we were going to Medina. And I thought, subhanAllah, if we're going to Medina, why don't I take the documents with me? So I printed out the application form and you know, I did my best to fill it out. And of course, it, doesn't, it isn't the easiest application form to fill out in the world. And I brought my certificates and what I could. And I left the Tezkiah. I thought, you know what it is? I'm going to go and see what happens. And when we got to Medina, uh, I actually went with Imam Zakaullah uh, from this masjid. And the two of us, we went. And when we were in Medina, I said to him that I wanted to apply to the university. And he had a friend uh, in the university called Atiq, who's a very, very good friend of mine. And uh, Atiq uh, took us or helped us to go to the university. But of course, we still had this problem of missing the Tezgiyah. So I was frantically phoning and Zakaullah was frantically phoning around various people. And we phoned the same sheikh who refused to give me the Tezgiyah the first time. And of course, he's from Riyadh. And he said, now that I've seen you've made the effort and you've come to Medina and you've got your documents in your hand, I'll give you the Tezgiyah. Except I'm in Riyadh and there's no way for me to send it to you. But he said, don't worry, phone this number. This is a teacher in Medina, he will help you. And we went to the Hajj group and asked for my passport so that I could take a, uh, the passport there to show them. They said no. We got to the gates of the university. And again, this is my second experience probably of Saudi, the way that the life works in Saudi. The security guard just decides to pick on me. Where are you going? And I said, uh, I'm, you know, there's a call I was translating and he's going to, for an interview and there's a doctor waiting for him and everything is, you know, everything is organized and they're going to give him his interview. He said, no, students only. You can't come in. So at this point, I have no Tezkia. I have only half my documentation. I have no passport copy and the security guard isn't letting me in. 
not going well so far. So I went out, and I don't remember who suggested it. Was it Zakawla, was it the brother Atiq? But I think it was the brother Atiq. Is that somebody ended up giving me a shamag, a red shamag. I don't know if I had it with me or if he gave it to me. I don't, I don't even remember. But I, he said, put on the shamag, carry these books, and just walk straight past him. <laughs> He's going to think you're a student. So off we went. And as far as I remember, we got stopped in the car park again. I don't know what they were doing that day because in the whole time I went to Medina after that, nobody ever stopped me for anything. But on that day, he was determined, you know. I don't know if he was getting commission or something for every student that he stopped, but he was determined. And in the end, we managed to get through with uh, a little bit of tawriya uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, are you a student? And the other brother replies, yes, I'm a student. And you know, like, uh, then the kind of everyone's nodding and everyone's looking at each other and smiling. In the end, somehow or other, we get in. We get in and we get to the, the university and I did my interview and everything went fine. And they ticked all the boxes and he said, okay, can I have your tezkiyat? Even the passport was okay. He said, no problem. Your passport you can send with another student, but I need you to have your two tezkiyat. So I said, I don't have them. Now, I had one of them, I think, was faxed over to me uh, by someone from the, the Markaz, faxed over me, maybe Abdul Hadi or Shu'aib, faxed over me at Hezkiah. So I had one of them, and I gave it. And I said, I don't have the other one. He said, I'm sorry, the rules are, we can't accept your application. The passport, I can leave it until another time your friend can bring it for you. But he said, the Hezkiah, we can't accept your application. I'm sorry we can't do anything about it. I can't accept you if you don't have the other tazkiyah. And so I was like, subhanallah. I got stopped at the gate. I had all these problems. I did my interview and now one piece of paper, I'm sure. And that doctor who had met us on behalf of the sheikh in Riyadh, he said to me, he turned to me and he said to me, uh, or he said to the brother who was doing my interview, do you have a spare piece of paper? The brother said, yeah, sure, there you go. He took a pen, he wrote Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, and he wrote me the Tezkiyah right there and then. He said, if you won't accept him, I will write him a Tezkiyah. There you go. And he wrote the Tezkiyah, and he gave it, and the man said, that's it, two Tezkiyah, everything's done, wait for the list to come out. I went back, I got married, and of course I didn't think anything about it. I didn't realistically think that. I don't think I ever thought I won't be accepted, I mean, we don't have that kind of sort of one, uh, you know, that Allah is not going to answer my dua or I'm not going to be accepted. But at the same time, I wasn't, I didn't have in my mind that, yeah, I'm going to be accepted. And by the time the time came for the list to come out, I had almost completely forgotten about everything. So then I got another call from Sheikh Shu'aib again. Brother Muhammad, I said, yes, Sheikh, he said, you've been accepted in Medina. And I was just speechless. I didn't, I mean, my first thought was, I'm married, I have a family. What am I, now what am I going to do? And uh, I think I was staying, my wife was in Birmingham at the time, and I was in Newcastle, and I think I phoned her and told her. And, uh, you know, mashallah, tabarakallah, I have to say, you know, uh, May Allah reward my wife. She's been incredibly, incredibly patient with me over this time. I mean, newly married and within four months or three months, I'm off to Medina. And of course, I can't take her. At least I said to her the first year, I won't be able, I won't be able to take you. And then came the issue of getting together the documents. Because for those of you who know about the application to Medina, it's a two-phase process and you have to go through even more difficulty once you've been accepted to get all of the documents and new tezkiyat and new this and that and the other. The biggest problem was ours was the first year that they asked us for a proof from the government or a permission from the government to study. Now this is some idea, I don't know the reasoning behind the person who came up with this idea, that every student who goes to Medina has to get a permission from the government which says that he is allowed to study more than that that the government will take responsibility for him if he was to uh, engage in anything that he shouldn't 
And this is something, I mean, we went to the foreign office and I remember I went to the foreign office and I don't know if I went with uh, Aqil or if I went with someone else, but I remember, going, I remember going to the foreign office and in the foreign office, they, they laughed at us. They said, you have a passport which says you're allowed to go wherever you want. If we didn't want you to go, you wouldn't go. We would put you on a, you know, whatever, no-fly list or whatever it is. You have a passport. You can go wherever you want. Why do we need to give you a letter to say that you're, going, that you're going to go? The foreign office is not going to do this. So then we thought we might try and get a police record check or anything that we could pass, but it just wouldn't work. Time went on and on. Study started, and we were no closer to getting it. We went, I probably made 10 trips to London, maybe more, at least 10 trips to London. And from Newcastle, that's not a short distance. Every time the cultural attaché, those people were so difficult. They made life so hard for us. They refused to talk to us, refused to help us come back tomorrow. You know, the usual thing that, you know, you, you're in the queue, they serve everyone, and then you come to the front, and then they close the thing and say, come back tomorrow. I'm like, yeah, I'm from Newcastle. Come back tomorrow is, uh, you know, a 700-mile round trip. It's not like just come back to come back tomorrow. You know, when they go into drone mode, come back tomorrow. But yeah, I'm from Newcastle and I just need you to take this, come back tomorrow. It just, and it goes on and on and on, you know. After a while, you get used to it. You get completely used to it. But at the beginning, it's very difficult to deal with. In the end, to cut a long story short, it was a very trying time and we even got to the point where we thought that we wouldn't be able to go. And we were told that they wouldn't accept any European students this year and that we wouldn't be able to go to Medina, we wouldn't be able to study. We kept on making dua, we kept on going, we kept on trying, we kept on having the door slammed in our face. And in the end, uh, the Sheikh again from Riyadh came again to Newcastle. And we mentioned the situation to him and he became very angry with the embassy. And all I remember is he picked up the phone and from what I could gather of the conversation, he phoned the ambassador and he said the ambassador wasn't available. And he was shouting on the phone, well, if not shouting, he was, he was visibly sort of uh, angry. And he said, tell the ambassador to call me back as soon as he is finished. And he gave the ambassador a real hard time. He said to the ambassador, well, you know, what's going on with these students? Why are you stopping their visas? Why, you know, what is this going on? The ambassador said, I have no idea. This is all the visa section. I never knew anything about it. Give me a couple of hours. Within two or three hours on that day, everything was sorted. And that's another thing I learned about Saudi. The wasita. If you know the right person, something can be done very, very quickly. One call to the ambassador, suddenly there's no condition for any letter from the government and there's no condition for any paper and the visas are ready. And the same people who were so uh, rude to you before are suddenly incredibly nice when you have a letter from the ambassador. You know, they, they were so rude to you before and they're so nice to you. They change in a second. And one of them said to me, oh, you know, you put me in a big trouble. You almost lost me my job. He was very angry with me. And what can you say to him? He said to him, yeah, you know, this is the way that you treat us. How, what did you want us to do? He said, oh, you shouldn't have gone to him. You should. In any case, we got everything together. We finally got our papers and off we went to Medina. As always, everything is rush, rush. Because as soon as you get your papers, we realize that by now study has gone on for at least, I mean, in my mind, a month. I might be wrong, but I think at least a month had passed where study had started. And we, we turned up very, very late. And imagine this. I land in Medina. And of course, the normal way is when all the students are being accepted, there are people to meet you at the airport. And there are people who do this. And there are people who organize you. We had nobody. Alhamdulillah, a brother from uh, the Seychelles picked us up, a brother called Abdurrahman, picked us up in his car because he was meeting some other brothers who were from London, who was all, that brother was from Mauritius, which is, a very, which is very near, and uh, the two of them knew each other, and he ended up taking us uh, in his car or in a taxi following his car, turned up at the door of the Jamia, still nobody there. This is, I mean, term has started, they're not doing enrollment anymore, we went, we had to find out, and you know, this is the usual thing. You're running from building to building, and you soon realize that the campus is big, and it's very hot. 
and the campus is big. It's not a small campus to walk from one side to the other. Uh, and, you know, you're walking back and forwards and go here, go there. And the same thing again, you know, just of, you know, the bureaucracy and the, you know, go here, go there, go to this guy, go to that guy. And I, I mean, I have so many stories I can tell you about the bureaucracy. I had one guy rip up my paper and throw it in the bin because the previous guy had signed it in blue ink. Not because blue ink wasn't allowed, because he didn't like blue ink. He said, I don't like blue ink. And he ripped it up and put it in the bin. Go and get me a one in black ink. And it wasn't me that had written in blue ink. It was his other colleague who had written in blue ink. Ripped it up, put it in the bin. Go and get me one in black ink. In the end, you get completely used to it. At the beginning, many students leave. Many students leave because of the combination of stress, the combination of pressure, the combination of being far away from family, of having difficulty in the way that people uh, treat you in uh, you know, issues to do with the, the weather and to do with uh, their health and people getting sick when they first came, and large number of people, a large number of people left. So we were allocated what I now call the infamous building number one. Building number one, How, what can I tell you about building number one? Even the rats moved out. <laughs> Even the rats moved out, wallahi, the rats moved out of building number one because it wasn't a high enough standard for them. I mean, subhanAllah, this building was marked for demolition. <laughs> you know it's bad when the building itself is marked for demolition, you know, like, and they put us into building number one. And um, we were six people to a room, and there were a couple of students from the UK in my uh, room, and uh, that was a whole new experience. I mean, I don't want to talk too much about it because the time is going to go, but that was a... That was a whole, a whole new experience, you know, to be with students from other countries, people from countries you never even heard of, and people who, um, to put it in a nice way, don't have the same standards of hygiene that you have. And the toilets and the showers were a nightmare. I mean, one time, I'll tell you how bad it got. One time, we saw, you know, you're waiting in a long queue for the toilet, and the guy goes into the cubicle before you, and he closes the door, and then he you see him, you just see the upper part of his torso just raised right up above the toilet cubicle door. And at this point I'm thinking, that's weird. And he's actually stood, because he's never seen a regular Western style toilet before, he stood himself on the cistern. He's climbed up <laughs> onto the cistern. And he stood himself over the cistern and he's, you know, he's doing what he's doing. And that, that's not a nice thing to go into when you're the next guy in the cubicle. And this is the kind of situation in the beginning. And of course, you know, at that time, you're on a high. You know, you're so happy. It's Medina. You're here. You finally got here after all that difficulty and all of that trouble. And of course, building one soon became deserted very quickly because there were no partitions between the beds. There were six people to a room. The bathroom was terrible. Uh, and, you know, it soon became deserted. But I, I had this strategy that I thought, you know, I'm not going to try and move out because I'm going to try and bring my family and that means I'm going to get my own place. I'd rather stay here and probably end up with a room almost to myself because people are leaving that place, like, you know, as quick as they can. And they've realized that if you spend all the time between Asr and Maghrib kind of running between the other buildings and you find a spare bed, you can quickly go and put a request in to change your, your room to another room. And people were, were moving out very quickly. So in the end, there were only a few of us left in that actual uh, building and we had a lot more space than other people had. And it wasn't, it wasn't so bad when the, the, the larger number of people had, uh, had moved out. Of course, uh, in the early days in Medina, you have your experiences, and I mean, these experiences just keep coming. I could tell you them all night. I mean, the time when we all went for an x-ray and the guy went behind the lead screen but left all of us in front of the lead screen. So he goes behind the lead screen, puts on his, you know, big thick apron, lead apron thing with the lining in, and he's dressed up for his x-ray, and then he just does 10 x-rays just one after the other with us all stood next to each other, so we got 10 doses in one, we had all the injections, all the checks, all the medical tests, and, and again and again and again, and uh, you know, at this point, you are literally just copying the person in front of you, you have no idea what's going on, you know that there are one or two students who have a little bit of Arabic, and I'd done probably, I think, 
maybe six lessons from Medina Book One with, with Zakaullah, which was a huge help because I had something, at least I could, you know, had a few words. But you're just going and, you know, the same thing, the guy's talking to you as though you're fluent in Arabic and you're just nodding or shaking your head or turning to the guy next to you and asking what's going on. And I think uh, one of the first things, and, I, and I'm sure you guys are aware of this, is that the first thing that you notice is the other students and the, the fit and, and the problems that exist between the other students and especially the students from the English-speaking countries. And I soon came to the conclusion that just uh, uh, abandoning the students from the English-speaking countries was the better way to go about it because, I mean, we had students who used to stand in the corridor and there used to be a, you know, brother go past from, uh, you know, like maybe he's come from somewhere where there's not a lot of Islamic knowledge and they would ask him a question about Aqidah or they would ask him, what do you think about this sheikh and what do you think about that sheikh? And he would say, you know, la adri. And then they would, you know, sort of stand in the corridor and say, oh, he's mubtadi', he's an innovator. And, you know, this is the situation we found among the students the first day you go. Now, these are people, the brother who used to do this, wallahi, the brother who used to do this, he did not pray one prayer in the jama'ah. He used to hold some opinion. He said he took the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah something like that, that you don't pray in the jama'ah when you are, there's no limit to traveling, and he applied that to himself, and then he said that therefore, I don't pray in the jama'ah, even though the jama'ah was next door. And yet his shughul al-shaghil, the thing that he used to do day and night, was to stand and declare who was on the sunnah and who was off the sunnah. And this is a brother who doesn't have istiqamah, he doesn't have the most basic requirements of practicing Islam, let alone any ilm at all. But this was the situation. And this is difficult as well. It adds to the pressure because you become wary of the other students from the US and the UK. You don't want to mix with them for the reason that you, you know, it's just, you're just sticking with who you know. You know, I knew Aqil, I knew a couple of, uh, of brothers and you're just sticking with who you know because the situation is that all the talk among the students, there's nothing about Arabic, there's nothing about learning Islam. It's all about what do you think about this that happened and what do you think about that and qil wa qal. And none of it is referring it to the shuyukh and the ulama who were there in Medina. It's simply just everyone talking with hawa, with their own desire, with their own, or oh, I heard this from a student, we heard this. And of course, this is a time that, that really made, uh, it made it difficult for a lot of students. And there were some students who left because of this. At this time, um, Really, I had I developed a mentality. And the mentality that I had developed was, regardless of what happens, I will not quit. And I just had this thing that even if they phoned me tomorrow and told me, this has happened in your country or this has happened to your family, whatever happened, I swore to, my, to Allah I, and I made an oath to myself, I will not leave, no matter how bad things get. And my first test came when I heard that my wife was expecting. And that she was expecting to, to have our first child literally a matter of days after the last exam. And this was a time, honestly, this is the first time where I really, really genuinely thought of leaving. And I genuinely thought, look, this is, you know, I, I can't do this. I'm, I can't handle all this stuff that's going on. And I can't handle the fact, you know, I was only married um, you know, f I'd only been married maybe three months, four months. I'd then come, you know, to Medina, left my wife. Now she's expecting the due date is maybe three or four days after the exam time. You know, am I going to get back in time? What's going to happen to my marriage if I don't? <laughs> and all of these things. Um, but I had that attitude. I had that thing that, look, I, I, I did what I did in order to get in. I suffered what I suffered in order to get in. I'm not going to quit for anything, no matter what happens. So I did my very best. And I did my best to study as much as I could. Uh, and in my first year, I came to my first year exams. And I did, I did really well. I was really happy, alhamdulillah, with what I did. I did really well in my Arabic. And I was pleased with it. And it came to my second term exams. And the night before the exam, I was up late studying, the night before the exam. And then when I was up late, and in exam time, you see the masjid of the jamia is full of people studying at night time. And I was there studying, and I went to the bathroom. And the nearest bathroom was in building number two. And I went over to building number two to use the bathroom. And I opened the door, 
and a cat just jumped on me. And it was just this crazy cat. It ripped me, it cut me all up, it scratched me, it bit me. I, you know, hit it a few times. <laughs> um, and of course, the cat, off the cat went, uh, running down the corridor, but I was in a pretty bad state. I was covered, you know, in my thobe, my white thobe was covered in blood. Uh, I was like, you know, I had bites, I had scratches. And I remember walking into the masjid. And of course, my biggest problem is, I actually don't know how to say in Arabic that a cat just jumped and scratched me. And I didn't know how to say this in Arabic. So the best I could say was, the cat hit me. Barabani. Because I don't know how to say it scratched me. So the best thing I can say is, the cat hit me. So I come and I tell my friend, this cat, the cat, the cat, it's a cat, it hit me. And he took me to the hospital. And then they tell me that, yeah, it was a cat that had rabies. And you need to have rabies injections. Uh, and this is just, I mean, subhanAllah, this is just, this is the night before my main exam day, the, the day that I had the, the hardest exams on. And I literally finished my treatment and cleaning me up at Fajr. There was a lovely Saudi brother who was uh, the, a nurse working there. And he cleaned me all up, patched me up, and, uh, and uh, took me, and basically I, I got out of there at Fajr time and the exam was whatever, eight o'clock. So there was like two hours straight into the exam. Alhamdulillah again, my, my grades came out. I was very happy with it. But the problem was getting back home because I was desperate to get back home. And at that time, the university didn't have great organization when it came to tickets. In fact, uh, you would be very surprised to see how the students would behave when it came to ticket time. Uh, all the talab al-ilm went out the window, all of the adab, all of the akhlaq is gone. It's just a scrum and it's pushing people, tripping people up, uh, squeezing in the queue in front of people, you know, f fights breaking out. There's all sorts going on at the time. And I think this is probably worse because I was trying to get with the earliest group and there's a limited number of tickets and a lot of people are doing transit via London, so it's difficult. In the end, um, I remember, you know, really getting really upset with the travel agent because he was just being his usual self of, there's no tickets. And I said, you didn't look. And he went, yeah, I know I didn't look, but there's no tickets, you know. And he was giving the usual sort of thing. And I remember I even said to some of them that, look, this is really urgent for me. And all I'm, I'm not asking you to let me miss my exam. I'm asking you that on the day of my last exam, you let me go home. And the guy said, why? Why would you want to be there for your son's birth? Which man wants to be there for, your son, for his son's birth? He said to me like this, he said, this is uh, ajib. We've never, you know, ma sami'na bihada fi aba'ina al You know, we never heard our fathers doing anything like this. You know, that you want to be there for your son's birth? You know, he was shocked about it. In the end, I managed somehow with some changing of tickets. There was always a trick. You took the ticket from the university, then you went to a travel agent, and the travel agent managed to open the ticket and change the date and all of this kind of stuff. In the end, I got there, and in the end, I got there in time for, for Abdurrahman's uh, birth. And then came the next major event. And the next major event is the decision to bring my wife. And I promised my wife. I'd said to her that in the second year, I'll bring you. And of course, there was no iqama. I'd been in the first year all around. By this time, I'd got myself a, a, a house. But I wasn't in, in, in the flat. I wasn't allowed to stay in it because it's in a, an area where there are families. And he said, please don't stay in it until your family comes. And I said, that's fair enough. Uh, no problem. Uh, and of course, I didn't have an iqama for my wife. So I decided to do what all the students were doing at the time and bring my wife on an Umrah visa. The first problem I had was that the Umrah visa required a mahram. And the computer wouldn't accept me as the mahram unless I had an Umrah visa. So I got an Umrah visa stamped in my passport. And I had made the decision that inshallah, when it comes to the airport, I'm going to hand in my student visa. He's not going to see my Umrah visa. I'm going to hand in my student visa and my wife's Umrah visa. But I panicked at the airport time. And I thought, what if he sends, what if he takes my wife? What if he sends my wife home? What will I do? You know, my son was only maybe two months or uh, three months old. What am I going to do? So in the airport, I handed him my Umrah visa. And I got stamped as an Umrah, uh, a Mu'tamir, a, a, a person performing Umrah, an Umrah pil pilgrim, and my wife likewise. And I didn't get my student visa stamped. 
So that was all fine, and I continued with my study. I mean, my wife found it a little hard when she first went, but, but again, she was very, very, very patient. And again, it came to midterm. And in midterm, you're allowed to fly back if you pay for your own ticket. So I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my wife back because she's overstayed a little bit, and I don't want her to overstay you know, months and months and months. I don't want to be one of those students who just keeps my wife there for six years on her Umrah visa and she's not allowed to go out of the house and she's frightened of getting arrested by immigration. I don't want to be like this. So I said, inshallah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my wife back. So I applied to take my wife back. It was accepted. And then I got called to go back to check on my visa. So I went to check on my visa. He said, Brother Muhammad, you're not in the country. I said to him, yeah, look in front of you, I'm right here. He said to me, you're not in the country. Your visa has been checked and you haven't come back into the country. So do you want to explain to me why it is that you're here and how it is you got here? So I thought, okay, now it's confession time. I came on an Umrah visa. So they said, look, in all honesty, we have to kick you out. You know, you, your, your iqama has expired. Your student visa has expired we can't get you another one and the, the normal system would be that we have to give you your papers and you have to go home he said you know if you'd come on your student visa your wife is not a problem she overstayed a month you pay a fine you know of a couple of hundred rials or whatever and she goes home it's not a problem you know but you didn't get your student visa stamped i'm sorry you know that that's it the best i can do is send you to immigration and try and see what you can do and there was a lovely brother in immigration. He said, look, I can't do anything for you. But all I can do is, the most we can do is to write to one of the princes and ask the prince who's in charge of immigration if he's willing to, to do anything for you. And at this point, they told me the decision not, was not to help me, but the decision was, is he allowed to stay in the jamia? So... After a long, long time, and honestly, this was probably the hardest time of my time in Medina. Because I'm being told that basically, you're going to be kicked out. You know, you're not going to be able to stay, stay and study. But basically, when the prince comes back, he's going to make a decision whether you stay or whether you go. And at this point, I get a phone call from the Sheikh in Riyadh. And this was, uh, this was weird. He phoned me up. He said, Muhammad, congratulations. I've got an iqama for your wife. I've got a residency permit for your wife. I said, Alhamdulillah, that's excellent. So everything was fine. I went home, I told my wife. The next day he phones me up and he's fuming with me. He's fuming with me. He can't almost speak because of how angry he is. And I said to him, Sheikh, what's the matter? He said, you've wasted it. You've wasted your iqama. You've wasted your opportunity. I said, Sheikh, what's the matter? He said, what's your name? I said, Sheikh, my name's Muhammad. He said, what's your other name? I said, Timothy. He said, why didn't you tell me your other name was Timothy? He had gone to a prince who was high up in the government and got permission for my iqama under the name Muhammad. And when he took it to the office, they wouldn't process it because my passport was in a different name. And they ripped it up and they told him, you have to go to the prince again. And he said, I can't. You know, that was a one-off opportunity. So that was a big high and a big low. Next thing comes along. The university say, please come and see us. And off I go to come and see them. And when I come and see them, they say to me that we've got excellent news for you. The prince has written back and you can stay in the university. And I was so happy, you know, subhanAllah, that I can stay in the university. I went to immigration. I walked in. I said, I've heard you've got good news. He said, I think the news is maybe better than you think. Not only can you stay in the university, but your wife can stay and your son can stay as well. So subhanAllah, the prince, uh, Prince Muhammad ibn Naif, Hafidahullah Ta'ala, yani he really did me a huge, huge, huge favor. He saw my application and he saw that it was a genuine error and he decided to give special permission for me to stay and for my wife to stay and my son to stay as well. And they had told me this is impossible. They said, even if he gives it, we can't do it for you. But as soon as they had that in their hands from him, they, they uh, were able to do it. And I left that year with a residency visa. The only sour end to the year is that I was so distracted by what had happened and by what was going on that uh, I wasn't really able to work as hard as I wanted to in the fourth module. And of course in Medina, the fourth module of Arabic is what judges you 
in the whole course. So they ignore the fact that I was, you know, I had a very, very high grade for modules one, two, and three, and they looked only at module four. And in module four, I was something like 0.1 or 0.2 of a percent away from the highest grade that I wanted. And that was a little bit bitter for me, you know, and I had to learn to accept that because that's not, it shouldn't be about the grades you get. Your study shouldn't be about the grades you get. But I was upset because I felt like I had got that grade all the way through, and then at the last hurdle, I'd slipped. And that was, you know, the situation with regard to that. And just continuing on, and I'm not going to take too much more of your time, there's a lot to say. The reality is that every single year that I was in Medina presented a new challenge. Every single year had a new test Every single year when you thought that you had gotten over the last test, a new test came along. And I've told you the tests before I applied and the tests when I applied and after I applied and coming to Medina and then the tests with regard to family in the first year and then, subhanAllah, with regard to the wife's visa in the second year. Every year something happened, year after year after year. And I just stuck to that mentality that whatever happens, I'm staying. You know, if this university burns to the ground, I'm going to be the last person sat on that desk. That was my mentality. And of course, the next year was all about kulia. And I had to decide what kulia you want to go to. And of course, you get told all sorts of things. Don't go to Dawah because that's where people go who are, you know, just looking for an easy ride. Don't go to Hadith because it's irrelevant. Go to Sharia because you can become a Qadi and you'll have all this knowledge of Fatawa and Fiqh. And people would say to me all sorts of different things. And then there would be the other thing, go to Hadith because that's where the Salafis are. And you know, they, the other kulliyat are full of people who are not upon the aqeedah of the Salaf. And you would hear left, right and center. Ya yeah, Ikhwan, the conclusion is this. The kulliya almost doesn't matter. My advice to the brothers regarding choosing their kulliya is that what matters is how hard you work. Not the kulliya you go to. Going to kulliya al Hadith doesn't make you any more upon the aqeedah of the salaf than going to any other kulliya or not going to any other kulliya. Nor does going to kulliya sharia guarantee that you're suddenly going to reach the level of a mujtahid and start giving fatawa in ijtihad and you know, you're going to become this huge figure, of a, this huge qadi who's going to you know, judge between the people. It doesn't work like that. The reality is, again, it comes down to you, who you are and how hard you're prepared to work. The reason I think you should choose a kulliya is the kulliya that you personally have an interest in. And for me, I just really, really, really wanted to, to study hadith. I loved hadith. I love the idea of hadith, the science of hadith. It's about what you want to study. It's about what you want to give that time to study for. And no doubt, I found in kulliyat al-hadith, the atmosphere amongst the students was better in the, than the other kulliyat. And I say that in fairness with all due respect to the other kulliyat. But kulliyat al-hadith, the atmosphere amongst the students in terms of their level of practicing and their level of adherence to the sunnah was noticeable. You know, you went to kulliyat al-hadith, you didn't see someone who was clean shaven. You didn't see someone who was muspil. Or very, very, very rarely. Whereas in the other kulliyat, you would see a lot. But that's not a reflection maybe necessarily on the kulliyat as much as it is on the type of students who choose it. But... Hadith, no doubt, was a fantastic thing to do, but I knew it was going to be hard. And I knew I didn't really have the hift, maybe, to be able to do it, because I knew that, I mean, by this time I had memorized, maybe I'd memorized three juz of the Qur'an or four juz of the Qur'an. Maybe I'd memorized up to Surah Al-Dhariyat, approximately, because I couldn't, one of the funny things, and I didn't mention this to you, but one of the funny things about me in, 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 the, uh, in the, the Arabic Language Institute is that I'm dyslexic. I'm not badly dyslexic, but I am dyslexic. And I couldn't read the Quran. I had learned Juz Amma by listening. And that's why if you hear me read Juz Amma, I have more mistakes in Juz Amma than any, other, any of the other surahs because, or, or any of the other ajza, because I learned it by listening and not by reading. And because they used to ask us to read from Surah to dhariyat onwards, I memorized from Surah to dhariyat because I couldn't read. I couldn't read fluently. I could read the letters, but I couldn't read fluently. 
And I really struggled if they, I was given a paragraph, I really struggled to read a little bit because of the dyslexia. And so what it was is I would actually memorize the surah that we were told to read from the Mus'haf. When the other students were just reading it, I was pretending to read it and I was reading completely, almost completely from memory with just the help of the letters, one or two to pick out to help me to read a little bit better. So I'd only memorized that much and I knew it was going to be a tough call in hadith. Because we had to memorize Al-Muharrar, which is a thick book of, of hadith. It's got a lot of hadith in it. It's a, it's a good few number of pages, um, maybe three, four hundred odd pages, something like that. It's thick. And we had to memorize it from beginning to end, on top of all the other stuff. And we were told, you know, don't go to Kuliyat al-Hadith unless you really want to memorize. But at the end of the day, I felt for me, it's not about the grade. It's got to be about working hard. It's got to be about being with people who are better than me. And this is one, you know, sort of final piece of advice or one of my final pieces of advice to everyone would be, is if you want to do talab al ilm, surround yourself with people who are better than you. Surround yourself with people who are better than you. Don't surround yourself with these guys who are on your level. Because in all honesty, they're nice, they're good friends, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't drive you to be better. But you surround yourself with people, all of them are, have better hif than you, all of them are more knowledgeable than you, all of them have better Qur'an than you. Then you drive yourself to meet, to, to, to meet their level and you push yourself to make up. You know, and I remember the first teacher, you know, subhanAllah, the first lesson we went into the kulliya, in Kulit al-Hadith, Sheikh Abdul Razzaq al-Abbad, Hafidhahullah ta'ala. Sheikh Abdul Razzaq, and he asked me the first question. And I was so scared, I don't even know what I answered. I, I, maybe I answered it more or less right, but I was terrified to even speak, you know. Um, because they took away that third year of the Arabic Language Institute where people used to get prepared. And this is a huge problem. And I think this is the, one of the points I want to, you know, sort of conclude with from the points of benefit. Is to say to people that it took me to go to Medina to realize that the Salaf had a way of learning. And that the Jamia Islamiyah, for all of its good, and for all of the blessings that are in it, and for all of the ilm that is in it, it doesn't teach you the way the Salaf used to learn. That's the reality, it doesn't. So you have to make up for that. You have to strive and make up for that. And I made huge mistakes in this, and it wasn't until I got into Kulia that I realized. I got into Kulia, and I realized that, hold on a minute, I wasn't going to the durus outside of the, the Jamia, I wasn't going to the lessons because in my mind I had, I'm going to learn Arabic and when I know Arabic, I'll go. But the problem is between knowing Arabic and between being able to understand a lesson fluently, there's a gap. Call it training period or a, you know, acclimatization period you need. And I could have given that to myself or if the chance came again, I would have given it to myself while I was still in the Arabic Language Institute. Go and listen, even if I didn't understand anything at all. But just go to acclimatize to the language. And so that hit me a little bit in the first, uh, in the beginning of the kulliya. And uh, then, of course, at the beginning of the kulliya, I began to spend my time in, uh, in the Masjid al-Nabawi with our Shaykh al-Allama, Abdul Muhsin al-Abbad, hafidhahullah ta'ala. And uh, I used to spend almost, I used to spend six days a week six evenings a week with the Shaykh, and that is, I honestly, wallahi, if that is all I did in Medina, it would have been worth it. If even one of those lessons would have been worth it for the whole six years, it was, I can't explain how much we benefited or how much I benefited from the Shaykh and how much I took from the Shaykh and how much, you know, there, there was nothing like it. And you know, the Jamia is pale in comparison, pale in comparison to the benefit that I took from a Shaykh Abdul Mahsina. Hafizahullah ta'ala and being able to sit with him and being able to observe him and how he answered the questions and how he presented the durus and to go through uh, uh, a little bit of uh, or most of Jami'a Tirmidhi and most of Ibn Majah with him and subhanallah my first time in the kulliya we had a teacher called Saud al Jarbui. and the teachers I had in the Jami'a Hafizahullah Sheikh Saud is, is amazing Sheikh Saud used to come in without a book and he used to go turn to page whatever whatever and he just start not just the words on the page the footnotes the page numbers the everything the commas the full stops everything this he's he was just uh, 
a machine, subhanAllah. Like you ne I never met anyone with hifth like that. His hifth was something amazing. He would come in without the book and just start quoting. And this is what Ibn Daqiq al-Eid said, and this is what Ibn Taymiyyah said, and this is what Al-Mizzi said. And he would just start going and going and going. And we would say, Shaykh, you know, to the point where he would correct you if you were reading from the book, he would correct you. He would correct you. And so his exams were legendary. You know, write down hadith number 365, two hadith that are before it and two hadith that are after it. I mean, this is, this is like, the sheikh was legendary. But the first exam I did, I did okay. The problem was, in all honesty, that I was always playing catch-up. In kulliya, I was always playing catch-up. I was never quite, in terms of the hifth, I was never quite there. I was always catching up with the other students. But I enjoyed it. In terms of understanding, I feel that I was there. I was, I was able to, to hold my own when it came to understanding, when it came to usul, when it came to principles, when it came to hadith, when I was able to hold my own. But when it came to hifth, I found myself always playing catch up. And that made me struggle a little bit. And when my daughter was born in Medina, she was uh, diagnosed with some uh, intolerances. She had lactose intolerance and uh, she had an intolerance to milk. And that distracted me again in, in the, I think it was the, the second year in Kulia. And that sort of made me, made me go into a problem. And that was the problem of absence, is that I would be absent and then it became a little bit of a habit. And subhanAllah, when I look back at my grades, I see the grades are fine. But every time you are absent, if you are absent too many times, they would fail you on the course. And so in that way, you know, I felt that Kulia was a bit of a mixed bag for me. You know, and uh, I felt that it was a bit of a mixed bag. I had very good grades when I was there, but my absences, for whatever reason, and I'm not saying all of them were justified, you know, it becomes a habit after a while. Um, that some of them, you know, led to, you know, failures being given, even though you know the subject, because they, if you miss 10 lessons in the, out of the term, they fail you. And that's it, you get zero. And so that, you know, that affected me a lot. And so again, my advice to the students who do go, is that whatever's going on in your family, not only to have that intention and that burning, you know, sort of desire that whatever happens, I'm gonna stay, but also that burning desire that whatever happens, I'm gonna stay in the class. Even if my family is sick, even if something is going on, even if I'm not well, being in the class is where that person needed to be. And that, that did affect me. And I didn't get the grade out of it that I wanted to get, not because I didn't understand the subject, but mostly because I spent too, sometimes too much time being absent and then had to, you know, to reset the course again. And so that was difficult for me. Uh, and it, at the time, it really, it really sort of affected me and it, it did kind of hurt me at the time. And it did kind of, um, it did kind of make me uh, a little bit upset with my time in the kulia. But at the end of the day, there's no doubt that the benefit was immense. And there's no doubt that, you know, at, as a conclusion, I got out of it more than I could have ever dreamed to have gotten out of it. And there's no doubt that if the chance came again, if the chance came again, I would have done it differently. No doubt. But the reality is, Allah decrees and His decree is the best of decrees. And it's something that we have to work to be content with. And there's no doubt that, you know, in my final point, and I wrote this down as a, as, as a final point, is that you have to ask yourself, or the students, and my advice to the students who are there now and those who want to go, is that you can't stop. You can't stop with Medina. I came back because of myself and because of my family. You know, my, I think my wife had been incredibly patient with me, and she wanted to go back. My kids wanted to go back. And, you know, we wanted to take a break. But there's no doubt that, you know, sitting here today, I don't look at myself and say, yeah, Muhammad Tim is where he should be. I look at myself and see that there is a level that I have to aim for that is a lot higher than where I am now. And that is what everyone has to do. And as soon as you become content with yourself, and as soon as that shahada, that certificate becomes what you lean on and you rely on, you lose, you know, you lose the benefit of it. And it becomes, you know, this is a piece of paper and I've graduated and that's it. Now all I do is I do my jobs and I just get on with it. For me, it's not about that. For me, it's about developing myself further uh, in things like the Qur'an because 
Medina doesn't give a huge emphasis to the Quran um, in terms of learning different ways of reciting the Quran, in terms of memorizing more, in terms of revising, in terms of catching up, and in terms of going further. And for me, going further is not just about a master's degree or a doctorate degree, but it's also about going further in Talib al-ilm. And again, I come back to the point I made, and I really will finish with this, that the Salaf had a way of learning. If you follow that way, you will be successful, inshallah. And if you turn away from it completely, you will not learn even if you spend your whole life learning. <coughs> Divide up Islam into modules, into subject areas, have a basic text in each one that you memorize and have progression through each one. So for example, you say, I've memorized this, I've memorized Thalathatul Usul, I've memorized Kitab Al-Tawheed and I've studied Al-Aqid Al-Wasatiyya and Al-Tahawiyya and the Tadmuriyya and the Hamawi, and so you have a progression in each subject, in fiqh, in aqidah, in, in uh, usul, in hadith, in every single thing you have a structure. And you keep going at it and you keep on memorizing and it doesn't stop. You keep on pushing yourself. And you know, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with being able to go back to Saudi very frequently. I go about three times a year um, and uh, at that time to benefit from the shuyukh as much as possible. But the reality is the same shuyukh come here as well. You know, they come here, they visit from time to time. It's all about what benefit you want to take out of it and how hard you're prepared to work. There's a lot more that I wanted to say, um, but uh, I've kept you guys for an awful long time. And so, inshallah, I think uh, the best thing is for us to wrap up there. You've heard part of the story and perhaps you've heard some of the more interesting parts. And I hope in the end that it has inspired some people to make that effort and to say that I'm not content with being where I am now but I want to develop myself further and I want to go and study and that those people who want to go and study realize that it has to start now and that inshallah if that you've benefited that from the talk then it has been something that has been of benefit for everybody inshallah I'm happy to take questions but I know the time is late so those of you please don't feel like there's anything holding you here those of you who want to get up and, and leave and you have uh, appointments and things to go to those who have quick questions I'm more than happy to answer inshallah